Heavenly Father, I thank you for your presence with us. I thank you that you are going to be ministering to us, that you have been ministering to us, you are ministering to us. I ask that you would help me now to speak your word and that you would translate these words in the air into people's hearts, that it become the right size to fit inside our minds and hearts, that we may be fed, that we may be encouraged. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would strengthen us with wisdom and understanding and knowledge, that you would stretch forth even now our hearts and our minds. Stretch them forth, Lord, stretch wider, that we may be able to, able to receive fresh revelation from you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open up to us the Scriptures, that we may believe. Lord, as the Ethiopian man was with Philip, and you blessed him and opened his heart and mind to receive and understand the Scriptures, and he believed, because the Word of God builds us. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. We pray, Lord, that we won't merely have the words spoken over us, but that we would receive them into our ears, into our minds, and deep down into our hearts. That we would be strengthened, that we would be changed, because your word is life, and your word is life-giving. And we ask for that life now to penetrate deep inside us, to nourish us, to renew us, to guide us, to lead us. In Jesus' name. Ephesians 1 verse 3, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. So we have two truths. We have two worlds. Worlds. We have this sensory world, which is the Bible calls carnal, the carnal world. We have a carnal mindset. It's not necessarily sinful, but we see the physical realm. We experience the physical realm. For some reason, God, who is in a spiritual realm, created us in a new realm, the physical realm. It had never been done before. He invented it. He created it. And we exist in a physical realm. And because we're stupid, we think that the physical realm is the only realm. Before the fall, Adam knew this wasn't the case, but part of the fall is that we're dumbed down. We've been dumbed down. Now we think this flesh and blood and this physical realm is the real world. And the spiritual realm is some kind of ethereal, mysterious, ghostly, weird place, maybe. And then when you die, you sit in a cloud and play a harp and all of that foolishness. No, the spiritual realm is the real world. God exists in the real world. God is real. God has a, has a body. We were made in his image. When we see him, we will recognize him. He will have the shape of, of ourselves because we're made in his image. He has a face. He has arms and legs and a head. He has a body. It's different to us because we are just a very pale shadow, an impression, an image of him. But the spiritual world is the real world. When you die, you go into the real world. So when your granddad passed from this realm, he didn't die. He merely transitioned from this world into the real world. And this is the great battle, and Satan works to hide this truth from us, to make us think that this is the real world, flesh and blood. And everything is real that you can see with your physical eyes, that you can hear, that you can touch, that you can smell, that you experience, that's real. God and the spiritual world is like, we don't know, so we make things up. The enemy suggests things. It's not real. It's not the real world. But our blessings have come into the real world. We now, through Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ, by making him our Lord and Savior, by accepting his provision of the cross into our lives, we now enter into that spiritual realm. We have a place in heaven. 
We have a status in the spiritual world. We, we have the Holy Spirit who's come to live inside us. That doesn't exist if you're just someone who doesn't put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have that. We are a special people. That's why we are one family. We have different languages. But we are all belong to a new family. We are a new race. We are not, we are not British or Korean or Gypsy or Slovakian or French or... Ghanaian, whatever. We know no longer that's not really our true identity. It says so on our passport. But our true identity is that we are now in Christ and we have a place in heaven. Amen. Romans 8, verse 6. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So the carnal mindset, it doesn't produce anything, any life in it. So we're going to talk today about healing the sick. Healing the sick is something that we, have, we are entitled to, according to the finished work of the cross. And our blessings, our healings, exist in the spiritual realm. They are more real than your sickness and your illness. Because your sickness and your illness exist in the physical realm. So as we believe in the finished work of the cross, so it will be manifested in the physical. But by failing to agree with the, the word of God and denying the healing that we really have in the spiritual realm, we block the healing that we are entitled to and we, we continue to be ill and even some of us die before our time. You don't have to get sick to die. Your life can just end. I don't know how your heart stops. Your your days are, uh, we, our days are numbered in the physical realm. Okay, so people say, well, you st as a Christian, you still die. No, we don't die. Nobody dies. We simply merely transition. So I know your granddad. He, I was there that night. He transitioned. He transitioned from one body to another body. He transitioned from one place to another place. Death is not an ending. Death is, no, death is not a beginning either. Death is merely a continuation of your life, but you've transitioned from one place to another, from one existence to another. Okay. Victorious warriors win first, then go to war. Defeated warriors go to war first, then try to win. That's a very interesting mindset. You need this if you're playing football and you want to win. So Manchester City have trans transitioned. Now we have a victorious mindset. Pep Guardiola, he wants to win every game. Okay? I believe that Arteta is the same and some others. Klopp is the same. Their desire is to win every game. And they believe they're going to win and they know they're going to win and they go and win so often. And that's an image of a, of a Christian mindset that we are victorious. We are a victorious people and we've won the battle first. According to the finished work of the cross, we carry the victory. There's nothing the enemy can do once we know that we've won. What's he going to do? Kill us? Martyr us? You think Stephen was afraid of that? <laughs> the moment his spirit left his body, the Lord Jesus was there, met him personally and escorted him into paradise to his reward. What kind of defeat is that? It's no defeat. There's no defeat. It's a victory. We as Christians need to envy. We need to be jealous of those who, who, who leave this body and go into their new body and enter paradise. Yeah? That doesn't mean you go and... No, I'm not going to say that. Right. But it's no loss. It's no loss. If the enemy came in today and just said, one of you is going to be martyred today, we all should all be like this, me first, me, me, me. Okay? That's what I expect from you. No, but the early Christians were like this. The early Christians were like this. You know? We need to carry, because we know that we're victorious. Amen. And the secret is, anyway, the one that gets martyred, we're going to go in the evening and, and raise them back to life. Yeah? Okay? So... 
We carry a victory with us. Victorious warriors win first, then go to war. We approach sickness having already been healed. Now, this is, this is like messes your head up, okay? This is going to mess your head up when we really get into this. We approach sickness knowing that we have already been healed because God's word says that we are healed and God never breaks his word. The difference, there's many differences, but one of the differences between Jesus and all the other so-called gods is that Jesus tells the truth and the others are liars. They hold something back. There is no promise of salvation from any other religion. And that's kind of not lying because actually they don't have the power to do that. They don't have the authority to do that. Only Jesus has the power and the authority. But they lie to you. They hold you back from the truth. They hide the truth from you. But God's word is true. The Bible is true. Everything in God's kingdom is congruent. It agrees with itself. It backs itself up. The cross is true. The word of God is true. It will never be broken. God's word cannot be broken. So when we have a sickness, that sickness is in disagreement with the word of God. And when we apply the word of God to that sickness, that sickness has to go. But in a carnal mindset, in our mind, we don't agree with that because our sickness is real. We have pain. We have symptoms. We have a word from the doctor. You've got stage four cancer. You're going to die. Um, when? Soon. Next six weeks, whatever. You have a cold. It's real. The, the doctors can't do anything about a cold. Our sickness is real, but it's a reality in this carnal world, this physical realm. And we, we understand it with our carnal mindset. But in the spiritual realm, we have already been healed. So when we get into the word of God, let me read another word, another scripture. Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is that good and perfect will of God. Our minds need to be renewed because they're saturated and full of carnality and the message from the world and the limitations of the physical realm. But when we are renewed in the word of God, which is life-giving, we see that actually we have been healed. And in the spiritual realm, we have every blessing in Christ Jesus, according to Ephesians 1. So let's look at some scriptures. Isaiah 53, 5, by his wounds... But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Now, I asked a, a lawyer in America about the language. I read a few scriptures, and I asked him to talk to me, to tell me about the language. And he said he was kind of an expert at language as a lawyer. And he said so much language is is um, wishy-washy. You can take it this way, you can interpret it. But these scriptures are crystal clear. It's almost like a, a legal document. They, there is no doubt that the message here is that by the injuries that Jesus suffered on the cross, we are healed. I want to give you an example after the cross of, of somebody who took advantage of the word of God and applied the word of God to the physical realm rather than bringing the defeat of the physical realm into the everyday life and then trying to get someone healed. Okay, so you bring, the truth is the man's ill. The truth is he's, he's in pain. He has a big tumor on his head. That's the reality. Well, that's a reality with your physical eyes. But Peter had a different reality, a higher reality was that this man is healed. And therefore, the man was healed. Amen. 1 Peter 2, 24. Peter knew this truth. And listen to the language. Peter said, He, Jesus himself, bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Amen. You see the interesting change in the language so Isaiah 53 by his stripes we are healed that's the reality by the, the the wounds of Jesus on the cross we are healed but Peter now takes it one step further 
he says, by whose wounds you were healed. Past tense. The healing has already been done. So if we're going to pray for somebody who's ill today, we're not asking God, Lord, we ask you, it's a good person, this, you know. Samuel's a good footballer and he's doing well. He's got his, you know, his hair looks nice and everything. We just bring him to you, Lord. He's a good one. He says, he's a good one. Could you do it for him? This is Jesus. You know, I think we confuse God sometimes. God's conf the angels certainly are confused. God's not confused. The angels are like, this is weird. You know, they, they've got the word. By his stripes you were healed. He's already healed. So what they need to do is apply with the authority that they have, the healing now from the spiritual realm into the physical realm. What do you do? Actually, most of the time you don't pray. You speak. Well, why are we praying? God's already done it. Why are we talking to God about something that he's already finished and accomplished? Acts 5. This is after the cross. This is an ordinary man. It applies to women as well. Okay? So it's someone like Marek. You know? It's a good guy. Just an ordinary geezer. As a result of the apostles' work, Sick people were brought out into the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. Because Peter carried in his mind a spiritual mindset, not a carnal mindset. So these people... Crazy, epileptics, mentally ill, schizophrenics, cripples, cancer, heart problems, all the rest of it. They came and he didn't focus on all the symptoms and all the illnesses. He was, his mind was fixed on the word of God. And he knew that we have already been healed. So he merely applied the healing. Even to the point that I hope we get to, where you are so fixed in the spiritual realm on the word of God, that even your presence... When somebody sick comes into your presence who wants to be healed, not just anybody, somebody who wants to be healed and they come to you, just being around you they get healed. Just coming into our worship time will be healed. We had an amazing worship time this today. And it's just so great. I felt the Lord was leading and the Lord was here. And, you know, we're going to experience the healing taking place. It's not just prophetic words and the leading of the, of, of, of the word. It's going to be, people are going to be healed because you're coming into the, the presence of Jesus where there is only life and healing. So what do we do when we approach sickness? We need to approach it. Let me just read that opening bit again because this, I think this is really good. Victorious warriors win first, then go to war. Now the church, by and large, the church, speaking of myself as well, defeated warriors go to war first, then try and win. So I don't have 100% confidence that this person's going to get well because I'm basing that on my faith, my ability, um, my history, and um, the history of every other Christian around me. So it's not exactly 100% confident, you know, I'm kind of defeated by my limitations as a, a man, as a minister. My history, which is not great. Um, my track record of healing the sick. Your track record of healing the sick. Um, the doctors at the hospital have pronounced, you know. Um, and it, they're not at fault. The doctors are not at fault. They are merely speaking from a carnal mindset. It's not necessarily sin. They're not sinning. And sometimes they do, the way they speak. But... You know, they're not necessarily sinning. They're just in a carnal mindset. And they're speaking a reality, but we have a higher reality. So if I approach a sickness without focusing on the finished work of the cross and the word of God, I'm already defeated and I'm trying to get some victory out of, you know, retrieve something. And we have results. I mean, we've had, we have results of healing in this church. I have to say, from churches have actually been in, these are the best results I've ever seen. We've had some great results. But we're still trying to retrieve something from the defeat. We're still trying to claw back some victory 
out of a, a position of negativity and um, you know focusing in a carnal world. What we need to do is to realize that we're victorious and the person is healed. If the person doesn't, if their symptoms don't change, they're still healed. If they, if they continue to be ill and die, they're still healed. Do you understand? No, we didn't apply the, the healing to the person, but they're, they're healed. Their healing is available, it's finished, it's complete, it's ready for them to possess. The mindset is so massively important. Jesus said, when you pray, if you ask anything in my name, if you believe, then it will be given to you. I'm paraphrasing there. Let's see if we've got the scripture. Well, I've got that one instead. So, it's very interesting because as we believe, so it will be manifested to us. Jesus said to somebody once, go as you believe and let it be done unto you. And the person was healed. And that was great because they had, they had a belief that they would be healed. But Jesus says the same to us, as you believe, let it be done unto you. And that's why we see so few healings in the church. That's why we see so few breakthroughs. Because we don't really believe. We think, well, the scriptures, yeah, the Bible is good. I'm, trying, I'm really trying, Lord, give me faith. God, I'm really trying, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me. Stop doing that. It's just silly. Get into the word of God. Focus on the Word of God. Saturate yourself in the Word of God. Switch the TV off. Switch the carnal messages hitting us from left, right, and center. And then we have enough from our own selves as well. Focus on the Word of God and build your faith up. And then you're going to carry some belief. And it's like, okay, this person's got a headache. I know that headache, A, has been healed according to the finished work of the cross. And it's my responsibility now to deal with it. So we then... You know, are you, how are you feeling? I've got a terrible headache. Would you like me to pray for you to get that healed? Oh, yeah, that would be great. Okay, fantastic. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Headache, and I take up the authority given to me, and I apply the healing work that has been finished. I apply my victory into you now. I heal you in Jesus' name. It's not us that are doing it. It's the finished work of the cross. Jesus gets all the praise, but we have to do it. We carry that healing power in us, with us all the time Proverbs 23 7 for as a man thinks in his heart so he is as a person thinks in his heart so they are so if we're defeated if we carry negativity or doubt in our hearts that's what we're going to be and we're going to try and pray for someone it's very difficult okay I'm going to take it a bit further. When, what do we do when we approach sickness? Logically, I thought the first thing we do is thank God for the healing. So if Deborah's sick, if she's ill, and we're praying for her, we need to approach that with the victory. And therefore, logically, I believe we would thank God for the healing. Now, she's still sick, manifesting sickness in front of us. So we start by thanking God. Thank you, Jesus, that Deborah is healed. That every ounce, every aspect, including the symptoms and everything around Deborah, have been healed and taken care of. We just thank you, Lord, that this is done. Now, that's a strange way to approach a healing. Then we apply the finished work of the cross. Do we pray? Well, I think we ask, Lord, how do we pray? Show us, give us you know, guidance in how we do this. We don't need to dwell on that. We don't need to start boring God. By, we don't need to tell God all about Deborah's symptoms. That's what we do. Lord, you know, she's not feeling well. And um, she's got a headache. And, um, you know, Lord, uh, she had that accident. And, and five of her toes have gone on the left foot. Lord, you, you know, Lord, and it really hurts, Lord. It really hurts. I mean, she's screaming now as we're thanking you. As we're praising you, she's screaming, you know. But don't you worry about that, Lord, because we want to tell you more about it. It's like, what are we doing? What kind of stupid prayer is that? God, does, God sees, God knows everything. Okay. God is good. God is good. God is good. God is good. We, in our imperfect state, through God's grace, have healed the sick. I mean, we've had amazing healings in this church. We have. 
and we're going to carry on doing more. What I want us to do is to, we're not at the place where we walk down, we walk down Withington Road and people see us coming and they're dragging the old people out and they're dragging the sick people and the mentally ill children or whatever. They're not dragging them onto the pavement that we may walk past them and they all get healed. We're not doing that yet. That wasn't the ministry of Jesus when he was walking in a physical body in the world. In the world. That was Peter, who's an ordinary man. He was doing that. That's where we need to get to. Where we need to carry that victory of the cross into every situation. In our imperfect state, we have healed the sick. We will heal the sick. I've healed the sick. Years ago, years ago, when my life was not in a good place, I asked the Lord to heal me. Asked the Lord to do a healing, and the Lord healed me amazingly. You know, we were, we do get that, but I'm talking about goes going to another place. And um, Exodus 15, 19 to 21. Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot charioteers rushed into the sea. The Lord brought the water crashing down on them. But the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And then Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine and led all the women as they played their tambourines and danced. And Miriam sang this song, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. And then they had this amazing worship time because they had seen with their carnal eyes, their carnal minds, the victory of the Lord. And they gave thanks. So somebody walks wheels themselves in here with a wheelchair okay we're like we'll pray for you and then they get healed and their withered legs suddenly grow strong and they run around we're going to start praising God and singing and it's good that's not, I'm not criticizing that that's a great thing it's a great thing it's called a miraculous healing and it happens people who have a gift of healing the sick have a gift of faith and they do this and that's a God-given gift I'll explain something about that in a minute. That's wonderful, but that's not the normal Christian life. The normal Christian life is that we heal those people because we apply the finished work of the cross and we believe and they get healed when we command them to be healed. Miriam gave thanks to God after the victory. So she, they were a defeated people. On the other side of the sea, you could hear, live, read about how they were speaking to Moses, talking about killing people, going back to Egypt, why have you led us here to die, da, 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 da. There's no praise on the other side. No one slept that night. They're anxious, they're afraid, they're fully locked into the carnal limitations of the situation, which is that there are mountains either side, there is the ocean in front of them, and there is the Egyptian army, very angry, very highly skilled warriors, very highly armed coming at them and they are in a very bad place and nobody was worshiping God and you know sometimes that's how we are when we're approaching the sick because we're looking at the situation only from a carnal mindset what Miriam should have been doing is having the praise and worship session on the Egyptian side because the word of God had said that God was going to lead them to the promised land. He said, you will leave Egypt. You will plunder the Egyptians. And you will go. And I will lead you. And I will lead you to the promised land. If they'd have focused on the word of God, they would have been in a place of victory. Amen. And you know, we don't know what would have happened. We don't know. Something, that, something amazing would have happened because the, they were focusing on the word of God. Because God is not a liar and his word cannot be broken. So when God said, I'm going to deliver you out of Egypt and take you to the promised land, they had nothing to worry about. Because the reality was not carnal reality, it was a spiritual reality. And God's word is more real than what you can see and feel and touch, than the word spoken by us, by a diagnosis from the doctor. God's word is more true, is true. And any other word is measured against God's word. If they'd have had a million people dancing with tambourines and praising God for his deliverance, praising God for the promised land, what would have happened? I don't know, but maybe something more miraculous than what happened. You know, in that occasion, God's grace was there because God is a graceful God. Thank, thank, thank you, Lord. And he provided deliverance because he was teaching his people. 
He knew that they were daft and he knew that they needed, you know, his grace at that moment. So he provided grace. He parted the sea and, you know, he'd prepared a leader for them who was focused on his word, not on the carnal. God. Moses wasn't bothered. Moses wasn't worried because he, was, he had a word from God. So he knew he was delivered. Even if the Egyptians came and killed everyone, Moses knew that the word of God was true and they would go to the promised land, a different promised land, a better one in heaven. But anyway, I don't know. Moses was not thrown by the carnality of the situation. So God prepared a leader, but then God brought a deliverance. Now, as they journeyed to the promised land, they continued to fall into sin. And not all, God's grace wasn't always there for them. They got punished and ultimately all the adults failed to reach the promised land. Only the children, according to the words that the people themselves had spoken. They refused the word of God and they focused entirely on the carnal world and they ended up dying in the wilderness. Which to me is where the church in Britain is today. We're dying in the wilderness today. That's, that's the reality. Churches are closing down every, every day. Churches are closing down in Britain. Congregations are dwindling. I mean, goodness me, how many do we have here today? Two or three hundred, I don't know. Not many. We don't have many. You know, because that's where we are. We're, walk, we're wandering around in the wilderness, and we need to wake up to the reality that the people are tired of a carnal church. They want a church who, who take hold of the authority that God has given them and go out and heal the sick and drive out demons and preach the gospel and are people of joy, and are people of peace, are people who are generous, are people who have th that something to give instead of, you know, wanting money off people for the building or whatever foolishness that is. I don't know, I don't know what that is. So we need to have a, an attitude approaching sickness focused on the word of God and begin by praising the Lord. And if the, if the symptoms persist, persist, we know the symptoms are a lie. There is a higher truth. And taking that with that confidence, we approach, this, approach the illness and the sickness. And I believe we're going we're gonna to go forward and we're going to dramatically change where we're up to. Proverbs 4. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my... What? What's that? We've got mice in here today. Listen carefully to my Yeah. Oh Walling, come on, you got such a you got such a voice. <laughs> my child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. You know this scripture. Everyone we can I think about this scripture as a scripture about healing. But it's not this is a scripture about the word of God. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. For they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Proverbs 4, 20 to 22. So the word of God, we need to listen carefully. We need to not lose sight of the word of God because when we're dealing with a sick person, we're seeing sickness in front of them. When we've got a dead body, we see the deadness. The doctor says dead, okay? But we, if they've died before their time, we, have a, we need to see with a different, different eyes. We need to see them rising from the dead according to the authority we have placed that has been placed in us that we exercise at that moment. We need to see the healing taking forth, bringing, coming forth. Don't lose sight of the words. Let them penetrate deep into our hearts. I think the word of God, at best, usually penetrates into our minds if we're diligent. The church, I think, for, all, for us, let's say us, we're not criticizing anyone because I'm talking about me first and then us. The word of God, you know, if I was to say to, to me and to you, come up here and talk for an hour about something you know a lot about. Some of us would stand up here and we'd talk about all kinds. I could talk about football for an hour, no problem, no problem. 
how next season Manchester City are going to win the quadruple. Haaland, maybe another midfielder. Just go on, easy, talk about that, right? You know, we could talk about hair. You talk about hair, you talk about clothes, you talk about music, you talk about all kinds of things. But if I said, come up here and talk about the Word, talk about the Bible, talk about the Word of God for an hour, most Christians would be really daunted by that. They'd want, like, well, just let, hang on a sec, I've just got this. Let me just look on my phone a minute and get some words up that they seem to remember. And then they read it and it's like, oh, it's a little bit different to how I thought it was. Or they, you know, I haven't got my Bible with me today. I can't do that. Now, are you joking? We don't have the word. We have some of the word of God in our minds, but we don't have the word of God penetrating deep into our hearts because we're not listening carefully. It says, don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Because when you have the word of God deep inside your heart, you are a victorious person. You carry the word of God, which is life-giving and victorious with you all the time. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes, which is good, by hearing the word of God. We remember what Christ did for us. This is why we take the bread and the wine. We should probably do this every day. You know, Smith Wigglesworth took the bread and the wine every day. Derek Prince, they had the communion every day. We need to do this every day, not only to... to try and bring harmony into our relationships and the household with the, with the Christians that we live with. But, and there needs to be a harmony in church. There needs to be that peace. If two people are um, hating each other or they've got a disagreement, they need to sort that out before they take the bread and the wine. And we take the bread and the wine, why? To remember the death of Christ, to remember his blood was shed for us so that we are forgiven for our sins and his body was broken that we may be healed. That's this central remembering that God has made provision for healing by his death. I, we don't really take, I don't think we take communion remembering the resurrection of Christ. Of course Jesus rose from the dead. We know that's true. But we take the bread and the wine to remember physically his blood and his body that was beaten up, disfigured beyond recognition. You know, it's very interesting. The ministry of communion is at the heart of the healing ministry. It's also at the heart of the gospel message of, of, of forgiveness of sin. Can we do mighty works and healings? Acts 10, 24. I want to give two examples here. Because Peter and Paul were ordinary men. They had a bit of a, they had a checkered past, a past of failure, a past of mistakes, a bit like us. They weren't necessarily great men. Peter was not man, a man who was studied in the word of God. Um, he wasn't a theologian. He was a hard-working man. Paul was a theologian. Pa Paul had studied extremely diligently. Um, right. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter had entered his home... Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. Now listen, if Peter came, was alive today with the ministry he had, and he came to this church, and he said, you know, I quite like this church. I'm going to join this church. We'd be like, wow, that's amazing, because everyone, we know everyone's going to get healed now, because that's his record. And then when we go out into Alexander Park, everyone will be flocking around Peter, because he'd be healing the sick, all the sick, everyone, everyone who's sick, and preaching the gospel to them, and many would come to know Christ. How much honor and respect would we give Peter? I believe that in the same day, the same way, we would think that Peter was an extraordinary, special Christian. 
and we would actually probably begin to worship him in some form or other. Certainly the new believers would. Peter pulled him up off the ground and said, stand up, I'm a human being just like you. So then they talked together and went inside, where many were assembled. Acts 14, while they were at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with, a crippled, with crippled feet. He had been that way from birth, so he had never walked. He was sitting and listening as Paul preached. Looking straight at him, Paul realized he had faith to be healed. So Paul called out to him in a loud voice, Stand up! And the man jumped to his feet and started walking. There was no prayer. Because Paul knew that, according to the word of God, I'm carrying that victory. I've come from a place of victory. I'm in victory. So I just need now to execute that victory into this man. Because that is not real. The true reality is the finished work in heaven, the heavenly realm. So then he just applied that, that, that different reality into the situation and the man was healed. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their local dialect, these men are gods in human form. They decided that Barnabas was the Greek god Zeus and, the, and that Paul was Her Hermes since he was the chief speaker. And then later on it says, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard what was happening, they tore their clothes in dismay and ran out among the people shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We are merely human beings just like you. Just like us. I believe this is where the Lord wants us to go. This is where, this is the reality that we should be walking in carrying this victory, carrying the, the blood of Christ and the broken body of Christ with us as we go out into the world. Now we will be going into Alexander Park soon. We will be going out. I'm not sure how we're going to do it, whether we'll have a little meeting place and with a gazebo and then we'll go out in twos and we'll be talking to people, inviting them for prayer. I don't see us ready for that yet. I don't see us ready. We've got to get ready. We've got to get into the Word of God. We've got to start practicing healing. We've got to start doing this in our daily lives and start to get up to speed. Because it can be very discouraging if you just try and heal the sick if you're coming from a place of defeat. If you're defeated inside, if you're not sure that the people are going to get healed, it's very, it very, can be very discouraging when you're talking to people and trying to get them healed. But we need to focus, we need to get the word of God inside us so that when we go out, we're carrying a victory. So we know this person is already healed. Whether we get to the point where they physically manifest that healing is a whole different ballgame and it's not my responsibility. I'm going to just apply the finished work of the cross to this man or woman and, and give thanks that they are healed. It's very bold. It's not asking if we can pray for people. It's saying, would you like me to heal you? And then we give thanks to God for the healing. And the person's like, well, that's weird. You know, I still have this, this uh, ear that's missing or whatever. I still have the problem. And they're giving thanks that I'm already healed. I can't help but think of the film The Matrix with all of this going on. Two realities. Have you ever seen the film? It's your homework for this week to see the reality, to, see, to watch The Matrix. Have you seen it? Good. Hmm? Two what? Yeah. There's a blue pill and a red pill. And one, is it the blue pill? The blue pill, you go back to sleep. Because you're living in a, you're living a lie. You're living in this world which is real. It's a real world. You go to work, you go to church, you do this, you do that. You, you have an existence but it's a computer program. It has a reality to it, but it's not the true reality. Underneath there is a greater reality, which is, a, which is actually a, a much more uncomfortable reality. The true world, the place of truth. And I think um, one of the characters, Neo, has, he's challenged because he needs to change his mindset and his reality from the carnal world, as I would call it, the carnal world, into the spiritual world, into the mate, from the matrix 
into the real world. And when he comes into the real world, in the Matrix, which is the world that he thought was real, he can do all kinds of extraordinary things. Not because he's full of superpower, but just because he's coming from a different reality. And so he's able to fly. He's able to, to, to move very, very quickly. So when someone shoots him, he's able to move so quickly or just hold his hand out and the bullets stop and fall to the ground. I believe in that Christians. Rebecca Brown used to say, there's going to come a time where somebody will point a gun at you and shoot and you'll just hold your hands out in confidence in the name of the Lord Jesus and those bullets will stop and fall to the ground. And it's very interesting. You know, how can you raise the dead? What, what kind of foolishness is that? And Paul was preaching one day. He went on and on and on, you know, and somebody fell asleep in his sermon and fell off a ledge and landed on the ground. There's no fuss, no bother. Paul just thought, well, oh, just apply the finished work of the cross. Went downstairs, healed him. The man got up, went back upstairs. He raised him from the dead. He went back upstairs and carried on preaching or whatever he did. And, you know, it's just really great because he was coming from a different reality. So, watch the film um, and uh, try and understand what I'm saying. Watch the film and then listen to this sermon again. I would invite you to listen to this again. And get into the Word of God. Okay. Has anyone got a symptom or sickness or any issue that they want praying for? Praise God. Come forward, Marek. So just close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. I thank you for what you're teaching me and for what you're teaching us. Holy Spirit, we ask you to reveal this word to us. Reveal your, the words and the, your holy word to us. That we may be fed, that we may be filled with life. That we may begin to change our mindset from being defeated into being victorious. That we may begin to apply the finished work of the cross to those around us in this world. We don't rejoice and, and go crazy and praise, Lord, when we see the sick healed. We're going to rejoice and go crazy and praise you before we see the sick healed because in our spiritual eyes we've already seen them healed. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name.